Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. I am very excited to have Yusef Komanyaka with us this evening. His latest book, Everyday Mojo Songs of Earth, New and Selected Poems, 2001 through 2021, was due to be released this month, but the publication is moved to the middle of June, and yet he still graciously agreed to join us. Please show your appreciation by pre-ordering a copy of the book. I will post a link in the chat to the bookstore later in the evening. I expect all of you are here tonight by choice, not chance, and that you have some sense of the remarkable arc of Mr. Kumanyaka's career, from his early works, including Copacetic and Dien Kai Dao, through his Pulitzer Prize winning neon vernacular, onto Talking Dirty to the Gods, War Horses, and the Emperor of Water Clocks, along with his plays, performance art, and librettos. He has been called legendary, his works monumental. Yusuf Kumanyaka, thank you for being here tonight. The first poem I'm going to read is Several Mysteries of the Pelotopus. It's from a chapbook titled Night Animals and has artwork by Philly poet, Philly artist rather, Rachel Bliss. She tries to hide in a swish of wet grass because she remembers the first man like a wound, an old scar, a howl in the hush. Her skin is too tough for the marketplace. Otherwise, she would have fallen under a bullet or knife. She came from an old world, a prototype, the first chimera piece together by a prankish god. That first moment of light seeping from the cave, an oaf written on her back by the edge of a flood. Before she slipped from the egg, she knew a human face would make her heart explode into a clutch of stars. And the second poem from this chapbook um, is titled Night of the Ambadella. You huddle into a shell, a breastplate, a whisper in the dark, summon your canned one by one along the frontier. In your kingdom, errant night of undergrowth, even in your gut fear, you are always on the verge of a new border or at the edge before crossing into the interior of false prophecies. Desert blooms a bird of bearers fall into marshy hush around a sharp curve. Planetary lights sprang out of nothingness. How did you go wrong? With only blind faith and a dead star left in your eyes, where's North America? You've been around eons, not knowing when you left one age and entered another. But I found your Olympus of foolish odds in the modern world. Lovers in cars, delivery trucks, make the leaves tremble along the roadside. If you know this, little suitcase of guts and nails, 
you are still alive, even with your broken hinges. And the third poem, the last poem from the chat book I'm going to read tonight is um, another kind of night. I, I like to think that there's a playful but serious definition under each of these poems that are um, tribute to animals. Slowly, the remembered trees, a 900 year old sky, the call of birds, a mammal's snake snoozing beside a stone, a mass tall as a man an hour after sunset, jackals holding a ceremony at the edge of a lake. It all fades into rancor, but my own face is still the boys losing its features down there where everything is one God forsaken animal wounded in the nameless dark. All the faces are one Consolation where the dead interrogate the living. The motion of the sea beneath, God of moonlight, God of sharks patrolling the schooner, and God of laughter on the deck. Hyenas on a hilltop, are you still trying to tell me something? about mercy in this other night riding the trade winds the waves underneath a creaking eternity we are nothing but cargo moans in the belly of a rifen leviathan wind toss the sails toned down to tatters, beached up on white sand stretching out against sky for centuries. Seagulls calling to birth cries in the new world. Now I'll switch over and and read some poems from the new collection, forthcoming collection, Everyday Mojo Songs of Earth. I start with the very first poem in the collection, A World of Daughters. Say, lick clean at birth, say weeping in the tall grass where this tantalizing song begins. Birds perch on a crooked branch over a grave of an unending track into the valley of cooling waters. Lessons of earth, all questions on more of the first tongue say, I have gone back says the oracle, counting seasons and centuries, undoing fault lines between one generation and next, as she twirls sackcloth edge with pollen, and one glimpses what one did not know, say, this is where the goat was asked to speak legends ago to kneel and deliver a sacrifice. To feel a truth depends on how and why the singers 
song fits into the mouth. Well, I believe the borrowed rib story is the other way round, entangled in decree, blessing, law, and myth. One only has to listen to night-long pleas of a mother who used all thousand chants and prayers of clay, red orca, blown from the mouth upon the high stone wall, retracing a final land bridge to wishbone. My own two daughters and granddaughter, the three know how to work praise and lament, ready to sprout wings of naked fl flight and labor. Yes, hinge into earth. We rose from Lucy to clan, from clan to tribe. And today we worship her sun polished bones, remembering she is made of questions. No, mama is not always a first word before counting eggs in the cowbird's nest. It begins in memory. Now, say her name, Sedinkish, mother of us all. The next poem is titled, other side of the creek. We pile planks, sheets of tan, and sandbags across the creek till the bright water rose and splayed both sides, swelling into our hoorah. Our hard work broke July thrashes and fat June bugs in decades of dead leaves. Water moccasins hid in holes at the brim of the clay bank as the creek eased up pivot bones, hips navel and chest to eye level. When the boys dove into our swim hole, we pumped our bald fists to fire up their rubble yells. The Jim Crow birds sang of a salmon in Mayhaw after a 12 gauge shotgun sound in the bossy woods. If we ruled the day an hour, the boys would call girl cousins and sisters and they came running half naked into a white splash, but we could outrun the sunset through sage and rabbit tobacco born to hide each other's alibis beneath the drowned sky. The next poem is titled, The Camelite Lounge. I've been reading from this new book from the new section of poems, new poems. The Camelite Lounge. After, let me start off, okay. The Camelite Lounge. All the little doors unlock in the brain as the saxophone nudges the organ and trap drums to an echo of the great migration, tiptoes up and down 
the baselined. Faces in semi-dark cluster around a solo, edging towards a town of steel and car lines driven by conveyor belts. But now only a sign stutters across the Delaware sand. Trenton makes the world takes. With one eye on the players at the candlelight and the other on televised Olympians, home is a Saturday afternoon around the kidney-shaped bar. These songs run along dirt roads and highways, crisscross lonely seas and scale mountains, traverse skies and underworlds of neon honky-tonk, wherever blues dare to travel. A swimmer climbs a diving board in Beijing, does a springy toe dance on the edge, turns her head towards us and seems to say, okay, you guys, now see if you can play this. She executes a hat a back flip, a triple span, a half twist, held between now and then and jackknives through the water. And it is what pours out of the horn. Next poem is titled, The Body Remembers. I stood on one foot for three minutes and didn't tilt the scales. Do you remember how quickly we scrambled up an oak, leaning out over the creek? How easy to trust the water to break of a glorious leaps. The body remembers Every wish one lives for or doesn't or even horror. Ava Dance was a rally in sunny leaves. Then quick as anything, Janet Dixon was up opening his wide arms in the tallest oak, waving to the sky, into the flick of an eye. He was a buffalo fish gig, pleading for him, voiceless, bigger and stronger. He knew every turn in the creek past his back door, but now he was cooing like a brown dove and a trap of twigs. A water honed spear of kindling jotted up as if it were the point of a folly and humbug on a Sunday afternoon bright. Five of us carried him home through the thicket of a feet running, of a feet cutting a new path running and sleep years later. We were young as quantum balloons, flowering crab apple trees to double bloom and had a world of baleful hope and breath. Those Johnny run fingers over the thick wet on his belly, days we were still invincible, 
Sometimes I spend half a day feeling for bones, humming a half forgotten ballad on a park bench a long ways from home. The body remembers the berry bushes, heavy with sweetness, shivering and a lonely woods. But I doubt it knows words live longer than clay and spit of flesh as rock bottom love. Is it easier to remember pleasure on those hurt ease true as hunger of a summer rocking back and forth up rutting what's to come the shadow of the tree weighed as much as a band grenade i would like to say about uh, this poem actually is dedicated to the 14 young black men soldiers who threw themselves on grenades in Vietnam. There's no rehearsal to turn flesh into dust so quickly. A hair trigger, a cut hammer in the brain, a split second between man and infamy. It lands on the ground. A few soldiers duck and the others are caught in a half run and one throws himself down on the grenade. All the watches stop, a flash, smoke, silence. The sound fills the whole day, flush and earth fall into the eyes and mouths of the men, a dream trapped in midair. They touch their legs, arms, their groins, ears and noses saying, what happened? Some are crying, others are laughing. Some are almost dancing. Someone tries to put the dead man back together he just dove on the damn thing, sir. A flash, smoke, silence, the day blown apart. For those who can walk away, what is that burden? Shreds of flesh and bloody rags gathered up and stuffed into a bag. Each breath belongs to him, each song each curse, every prayer is his. Your body doesn't belong to your mind and soul. Who are you? Do you remember the man left in the jungle? The others who owe their lives to this phantom. Do they feel like you? Would his loved ones remember him? If that little park or stature erected in his name didn't exist and does it enlarge their lives. You wish he'd lie down in that closed coffin and not wander the streets or enter your bedroom at midnight. The woman you love should never understand. Who would? You remember what he used to say if you give a kite too much strain, it'll break free. That unselfish certainty. But you can't remember when you began to live his unspoken dreams. Turner's great tussle with water. As you can see, he first mastered light and shadow. 
faces moving between grass and stone. The beast waiting to the ark and then the decline of the Carthaginian empire before capturing volcanic reds. But one day while walking in windy rain along the Thames, he felt he was descending a hemp ladder into the galley of a ship down in the swollen belly of the beast with a cursed hook and a bell and bucket and to whimper and howl and to piss and shit. He saw winds hurl sailed and mass pole as the crewmen wrestled slaves dead and half dead into a darkened whirlpool. There it was groaning. Then the water was stabbed and brushed till the luminous and the bloodish sharks were on their way. But you're right, yes. There's still light crossing the divide, seeping around corners of the thick golden frame. Ode to the Oud. Gourd shaped muse swollen with wind in the mulberry. Tell me everything. You are made of little desert boat of raw, oblong box of bed and doves, pecking pomegranate seeds out of the air. You are the poet's persona, his double in the high priest's third chamber. Each strain that litany of stars over the Sahara Pear-shaped traveler, strong but so light, is there a wishbone holding you together? I wish I knew how to open you up with an eagle's feather or a pick whittle from buffalo horn, singing alive the dust of Nubia. Rosewood season long ago, I wish I could close your 12 mouths with kisses. Tongues strung in a row, I wish I could open every so sound in you. I envy one blessed to master himself by rocking you in his lonely arms, little ship of sorrow, been your voice till the names of heroes and courtesans, birds and animals, prayers and love songs swum from your belly. Timbuktu. I sing in elegy for the city of 333 saints, for every crumbling mouse and minaret, for the libraries standing for centuries against dust storms, for the nomads herding trees of life across the desert along trails where Campbell's haul salt to rafts swollen on the river Niger. Before 
the empire of Sandhe fell. The griots speak of an epic memory of stardust and sand, but now mercenaries kidnap, run drugs, and kill in bold daylight. Blood, money, brought them into Libya, and more blood money took them home, brandishing stolen guns and grenades. When Lord Byron speaks in Don Juan, where geography finds no one to oblige her, I hear my name. But no one stands up to prophecies the other side of limbo against the modern as a metallic eye drones overhead. Medieval clouds may promise safe passes or escape routes on the Mali, but the guard fearing cannot remember the faces of death after kicking in all the drums. Terrific reading, Yousef. Thank you so much. Thank you. So many of the new poems. Um, let me see about some questions. Listening to you read from this collection, I wonder how you chose the poems for the book. Is each section supposed to be representative of that book, say War Horses, or is there an arc you're affecting per section, i.e. by choosing from War Horses? And does that apply to the shape of the book as a whole? But historically, uh, for myself as such, I have chosen poems to, that reside, live beside other poems. Um, and uh, sometimes it's tonally, sometimes it is subject matter, and other times it's just uh, phrases that relate to each other, that establish a feeling, a place, a moment. When you read a poem aloud, are you inside it? And by that, I mean, are you thinking and feeling it as you're reading it? Or is it just words? I tend to, I think I've, <laughs> I think I feel it. One reason is because I have said a number of places that um, languages are the first music. So there is a kind of singing inside the psyche. So yes, I, I, I feel it. Okay. I was wondering also because I was reading along with you and I noticed um, you were changing some of the words and I thought it might be intentional. And I thought yeah. I have to check the, uh, I've got the galley, I'll have to check the final edition <laughs> and it comes out. Like the, the difference between speaks and in tones when you're talking about Lord Byron. Yes, yes. Will, will speak be in the published book and in tone stay in the in the galley? Um, in tones, I think, yes. Okay. Um, in and sometimes what's yeah. ha what happens in composing poems, often I remember the very first, um, the very first take, let's say that way, the very first, um, how the poem exists on the page. And then I have, uh, I, I also um, revise. So, so I remember the first take without remembering the revision sometimes. This right. is in the psyche that way as well. Yeah. Inadvertent improv perhaps? <laughs> right, right, yes. Um, you know, I was reading through your book, Blue Notes, and very much enjoying it. Um, and in one of the essays you write, I like the implied freedom jazz brings to my work. A soloist can go to hell or to heaven and back, bending a tune into an extended possibility. And then you write, jazz has been the one thing that gives symmetry, shape, 
and tonal equilibrium to my poetry. My question is, how do you balance extended possibility and symmetry to make sense? Well, I like the idea that um, um, at one end of the spectrum is symmetry, and at the other end of the spectrum is possibility. And the human voice, the psyche, are able to create the bridge. Very much like often, I think, of musicians, that there's the structure, and at the same time, that structure is, is stretch, pull this way and that way, and yet it comes together with a certain kind of, not prax, practice, um, tonality or spirit, but a surprise, and, and it makes sense because it's come from the same place in the psyche, in the spirit of the player. It seems like you're really comfortable pushing the edge of sense and sort of challenging us to, and trusting us to follow you there and, and, and understand. I think we have, I think we all have, we have that uh, just in us to create that bridge, mm. only if we go there. Not in a tortured way, but in a moment of freedom. Well, I'm happy to follow you there. A um, Couple of other questions. When you hear your poems set to music, and I'm thinking of testimony, for example, does it and can it change the meaning for you of what you originally wrote? when you hear it as part of a different piece? It may uh, extend or expand the poem, but I still hear the words as I wrote them. Uh, and thinking about the words as increments of, 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 of music. Um, I've said a number of places that, that the body is a great amplifier. And I, and I still believe that we feel, we feel the language. And I'm, I particularly think this is true with very young, very young children, that they've, they feel the music. Or uh, maybe we lose that somewhere along the way. Hmm. And along those lines, when you're writing a libretto or performance piece, does your style change to meet the demands of the collaboration? Or uh, it changes halfway. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm willing to go halfway. Uh, yes, um, I I like how others who come to to that collaboration, um, present something new. I I I like that. I I agree with it. I embrace it as such, you know. Um, I trust it. <laughs> that that is the that's the word I should use. I trust. Yeah. The collaborator. I guess you have to once you've said yes. Yes. <laughs> was this is uh, some questions from the audience now? Was there any relief in finding a way to give shape to the experience you described from Vietnam and a way to honor the phantom, quote unquote? Oh gosh. Okay. The grenade. <laughs> that poem was very difficult for me to write. Um, one reason, and I'm still in my psyche going over, I don't know what really, such a situation cannot be rehearsed. That's what I believe. It is in the individual, but I'm still reckoning with 
what prepares that individual for that moment, which is a split second. Um, I, I would like to thank, it's more than just saving Conrad's as such in that moment, but it's something that's probably been rehearsed from childhood, from about family and what have you. So writing about it um, brings it closer in a way. And then there are those moments of release. I've read you said about that story about you coming down the ladder and sort of the torrent of images that were pouring out of you. I don't know if this was written at that time or not. It was written later. I didn't know how to actually write about that experience until I realized, I said, oh, this is supposed to be a prose poem. And I wrote it as such. So that, that was the only way I could enter that territory. A, a, a somewhat lighter question here. Do you remember the first record you bought? And happy birthday tomorrow, this person said. Oh. <laughs> the first first record I bought, oh, you know, I would like to say that I remember buying Sam Con Cooks. You, you send me, and I still and I still love <laughs> you send me. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, he crops up in a poem or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Somebody asks, uh, this is from Walton Muyamba. Can you, Mr. Komanyaka, discuss what you've learned about the business of poetics and making music from rereading and building out this new and selected collection of poems? Um, I think it's an ongoing process. Um, we have to have a certain sense of freedom or to, to not just lock everything down in the psyche, to be able to, to write a phrase and laugh aloud and say, where did that come from? And, and realize that um, it is a moment where we may accidentally create, create a surprise that enlightens us. Well, here's to more surprises. The last entry here is from Tina Hallquist, who just says, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for sharing this evening with us tonight. I encourage everybody to go out and pre-order the book. It's a great read, wonderful selection along with a number of new poems, some of which you heard this evening. Yusuf Kumanyaka, thanks so much for sharing your evening with us. Thanks a lot. Okay.